Thank you very much, Shauna. It's uh, great to be here with you today on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish First Nations. It's always a pleasure for me uh, to get in front of a, a classroom again. I'm a, a faculty member at Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops in animal health technology. And now I get to go and uh, talk to energy policy classes, uh, natural resource development classes, environmental science classes at universities. And uh, it's a lot of fun for me because I really enjoy the dialogue, the interaction uh, that takes place. And there's something that's really um, kind of rewarding about uh, that. Well, the life that, that Shauna described is, is one that um, you never know when you get up in the morning what you're going to face, which is what makes life interesting, as I'm sure it is uh, the same for many of you. But I think of my youngest daughter now, who's at University of Victoria, and her first paper uh, was entitled Enbridge, Economics versus the Environment. And uh, so I had to relive a discussion that I had with her when she picked me up at the airport one day coming back from uh, Victoria to Kamloops when she said, Dad, we were talking about that pipeline in geography class, and I don't think you should let that pipeline go through. And I said, well, Gemma, you know that you're driving our car, and you, know, you enjoy driving the car. You know the gas comes from oil. Yes, Dad, I, I know that. Uh, so uh, what about this pipeline? And which pipeline are you talking about? The one going into the United States, the one proposed for up northern BC, or the potential expansion of the one that runs right through Kamloops? Well, I don't know. Maybe I think the one up north. And I said, okay, that's fine. Uh, but, you know, again, you know, gas comes from oil, and people enjoy driving their cars. Well, Dad, that gas, that, that oil is meant for Asia. And I said, well, you've been to China with me. I said, do you think a 17-year-old in China should be able to drive a car? Well, sure they should, but what about the environment? And I said, well, what about the environment? What about the environment that worries you about this proposed pipeline? Is it, you know, the potential for leaks? Is it the potential oil tankers? Uh, you know, the ability to respond? And, you know, as most 17-year-olds do, she turned at me. She said, Dad, I hate arguing with you. <laughs> but it's great to have those kind of debates with your own kids because then you realize that what you're doing is impacting uh, British Columbians and Canadians, and we're all in this together, whether it's talking about pipelines or whether it's talking about uh, climate change and, and what we're trying to do to mitigate and adapt to climate change. So I like talking about it. Um, sometimes, you know, we have it right. Sometimes we don't have it right. I, oh, boy, the press is here. Sabrina, remember, inside voice, inside voice. Uh, but no government gets it right all the time. In fact, you know, you're really doing well if you get it right more than 50% of the time. But here in British Columbia, I really feel on the climate change file that we have been real leaders. Gordon Campbell started it, and Premier Clark has made a commitment to uh, remain as leaders on the climate change file. So today I want to talk about uh, what we've done on the climate change file and what we're continuing to doing and the, the challenge that we have going forward, uh, particularly as we, we look at economic development and how that's going to impact some of the, the targets that we've set uh, for ourselves. Okay, so let's uh, talk about the climate action uh, uh, plan that we introduced in 2008 because we've set some pretty ambitious targets. Um, you know, our, our roadmap is uh, based on this 2008 BC climate action plan uh, that was, uh, you know, very, very much con uh, controversial, particularly in the 2009 election. But it continues to be our roadmap uh, for the future of British Columbia, which we think involves a very prosperous uh, green economy. It includes not only mitigation, and the mitigation measures are uh, based on the backbone, of course, is the revenue neutral carbon tax. And some people still don't appreciate what we mean by revenue neutral. And because governments don't always do the very best job communicating, it's not surprising that you know, we continually have to remind people what that means. Revenue neutral simply means that all the revenue that comes in from the carbon tax is offset by revenue uh, or tax reductions uh, in, uh, provi in provincial personal income tax, in corporate tax, in small business tax, and also in uh, rebates that go back to uh, people under a certain income level. Again, my other kids uh, phoned me and said, are we still getting that carbon tax uh, rebate? And I said, yes, you're still getting the carbon tax rebate. Unfortunately, you're not getting the HST rebate after April 1st. So um, the revenue neutrality includes the climate action rebate that goes back to people that are under a certain 
um, income level and also outside of the Lower Mainland and the Capital Regional District of Victoria, uh, homeowners get an additional $200 per year homeowner grant uh, because they don't have the same options for um, transit opportunities that they do in, uh, in the larger cities. So the backbone is the revenue neutral carbon tax and when people say we want to see the carbon tax used for green initiatives, that is if really if we're being transparent about it, when, when people say that, what they mean is they want a tax increase because that means if you're using uh, the, the carbon tax for green initiatives ab above and beyond what we're doing now, it means those other taxes have to increase in order to balance off uh, the revenue that goes to those other initiatives. So it's important that if we talk about using carbon tax revenues in that way that we be transparent about it. Um, we have intergovernmental partnerships with local governments uh, through the Community Climate Action Charter. Over 180 local governments signed this charter and that means that they get their carbon tax uh, money that they pay um, and, and they get it all back uh, if they agree to work towards carbon neutrality by 2012. And, of course, they signed it back in 2008. And a lot of local governments have been absolute leaders on, on this file. I mean, Vancouver is a very good example. But even smaller cities that you wouldn't really expect to be leaders, uh, Dawson Creek's a very good example. Mayor Mike Bernier in Dawson Creek He's an outstanding champion of climate change in an area of the province where, you know, natural gas drives the economy. But instead of uh, putting $25 or $30 a ton towards um, green initiatives, they put $100 a ton. They, they measure their greenhouse gas production uh, after they've tried to reduce it as much as possible. And then whatever's left, they take $100 per ton and put it into green initiatives in their community. So we have this uh, amazing, uh, these amazing partnerships around the province. We also have, of course, um, we are the first government in North America to become carbon neutral. That means that all of the, the core government operations and the government, uh, the uh, public sector organizations like Simon Fraser, like Thompson Rivers University, like hospitals, schools, uh, all try to reduce their greenhouse gases as much as possible. And we provided $75 million through a, a program to help them do that. And then, again, the, uh, the g greenhouse gases that are left over, they have to offset through the Pacific Carbon Trust and pay $25 a ton into that. Uh, then there are offsets bought around the province. So for every ton they can't reduce, a ton is bought somewhere else to, uh, to make us revenue neutral. And I know that's a controversial uh, um, issue. Uh, people like uh, Mark Jackard, for instance, from SFU. Uh, Mark and I have had spirited debates on that. Uh, but there are other people like Andrew Weaver, University of Victoria, that, uh, that think that it's a good policy. I think what it does, number one, it reduces energy consumption in the public sector, and that means we save hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars every single year on energy bills. And number two, it shows leadership, because when you come to a university and you know that it's carbon neutral, uh, I think that, you know, that, that flows over to you, and it's, a, it's a, just an attitude and a, and a responsibility that I think those of us that are involved in, in university like to uh, take on. Uh, so we uh, also have things like Live Smart BC, where we provide incentives for people to reduce the energy uh, consumption in their homes or small businesses, and we've developed uh, the first the forest carbon offset protocol, that, which shows, uh, you know, through... Uh, silviculture, growing trees, how you can calculate uh, and verify the amount of carbon storage that goes into that. So this makes offset, the offset industry in British Columbia more viable. So if you're in a jurisdiction, some European jurisdictions, for instance, where you have to go and look for offsets, you can come to British Columbia and invest in silviculture here in BC and have a system in place that is uh, you know, verifiable so that you can get your, um, your carbon offsets. So again, I uh, mentioned um, we do have pretty aggressive targets. Uh, in 2007, we wanted to cut our greenhouse gases, or sorry, in 2008, we set the baseline as 2007 and said by 2020, we want to reduce greenhouse gases by 33% and 80% by 2050. Those are legislated targets that we have to meet. Now, you know, if the government of the day doesn't meet them, what, what does that mean? Well, it means they have to admit publicly that they failed or, you know, they have to change the legislation. So it, 
it doesn't mean that we all go to jail if we don't hit those greenhouse gas targets, but it does mean that, you know, you have to openly admit that you're on the wrong track or that you need to change the targets or change the timeline. So I do think it's, it puts the onus on government to be somewhat accountable to the, the public that you are aiming towards these targets. We have interim targets of 6% by 2012 and 18% reduction by 2016. And again, we won't find out the 2012 results until sometime in 2014 because of the, the lag time in uh, counting up the greenhouse gas emissions. But, you know, so how are we doing? Um, we are uh, committed to this, even in the, uh, the, the jobs plan that the Premier announced, Premier Clark announced a year ago. Uh, we reiterated that we wanted to maintain our climate leadership uh, status and we wanted to con continue to work towards these targets. So we did have our first report on progress uh, towards targets, and we saw that between 2007 and 2010, our emissions in British Columbia actually dropped 4.5%. And there are those who will say, well, you know, guess what happened in 2008, 2009? There was a huge economic calamity, uh, industrial and commercial activity declined and that led to the reduction in the greenhouse gases and there's some truth to that absolutely that that uh, contributed to the reduction in uh, in our greenhouse gases but it doesn't tell the whole story it only accounts probably I mean it's hard to estimate entirely but maybe about half or a little over half of that was due to the decrease in economic activity and we all know that if we want to reduce our greenhouse gases the best thing we could do is obviously reduce all activity, but that is not really the way to support health care and education and universities and all the, the public institutions that, uh, that we expect to have in British Columbia. Well, we did see that, you know, the big thing about carbon tax that has been said over and over and over again, and you'll still hear it with some of my colleagues in Ottawa, uh, saying that if you put a carbon tax in, you will crater the economy. You simply can't grow the economy with a carbon tax in place. But in fact, with a revenue neutral carbon tax, all you're doing is taking the tax from something you don't want, carbon, and putting it, uh, or putting it on something you don't want, carbon, and taking it or reducing it from something you do want, which is success, income. So we actually saw our population increase and our GDP increase while our greenhouse gas uh, uh, totals were, were coming down. So that in the early stages seems to fly in the face of the argument that you can't have a climate uh, action policy and put a price on carbon and grow the economy at the same time. So if you look at our uh, gross domestic product relative to the rest of Canada, uh, you do see that dip there in 2009 that everyone suffered uh, when President Obama won the election and promised hope and change. Uh, with that hope and change, he was handed this great big anvil of a world economic calamity. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how the U.S. Uh, reacts to what he's done over the last uh, four years. But um, hard, I just, you know, as a politician, I can't imagine winning an election and then someone hold, you know, handing you this great big thing and asks you to walk off a plank uh, the way that he has been asked to do. So all of us around the world, of course, experience that, that drop in economic uh, production. So we do see the dip there. But then we started to come back, and of course in British Columbia, but Canada, but particularly in BC, we have weathered this storm extremely well economically. And you can see that the GDP across Canada continued to climb, but British Columbia's outpaced the, uh, the Canadian average, while our greenhouse gases were dropping. So we do see that something is real uh, and is happening here. And if you don't look at just the um, greenhouse gases, look at motor gasoline sales. And again here, you can see you know, the dip in 2008 starts to climb in the rest of Canada. Uh, quite substantially. And yet, look here in British Columbia. We're, we're down below the level we were in 2007. Uh, if you look at diesel sales relative to the rest of Canada, we are far uh, lower, and again, lower than in 2007. Light fuel oil sales, even greater difference between British Columbia and the rest of Canada. Even in natural gas demand, we've, re we've reduced our consumption relative to the rest of Canada. So there's lots of things that go into these, um, but when you get so many indicators showing the same thing, there's something real happening here. And I see Nancy is here, Dr. Olweiler, and she's uh, working on a paper now which also uh, lends even more support to the fact that we are reducing our use of um, our fuels 
partly because of, well, I won't put words in Nancy's mouth because I know she's still working on the paper, but from what I understand, uh, you know, the way that we price fuels in Canada is having something to do with how we use fuels in Canada and actually is increasing productivity uh, in the way, in the industries that use fuel because they're using them more wisely. So it's, it's kind of nice to see that public policy actually translates into uh, changes in behavior, not just on the consumer level, but on the, the, uh, the, you know, the corporate level. Because when you read all these books, when I read books, you know, Mark's book, and I read uh, Hot, Flat, and Crowded, and, and Andrew's book, uh, you think, this all looks good on paper, but how will it translate into the real world? And, you know, you've got to love economists because, you know, they, they love to see their experiments really play out in the real world. And in British Columbia, we actually are a living experiment in climate pricing. And so far, the economists are right. British Columbians are acting the way economists expected us to act when we put a price on carbon. So uh, we have 2.9 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions in British Columbia uh, so far, up to 2010, a reduction of 2.9 million tons of uh, greenhouse gases. That's um, equivalent to the emissions of 2.87 million homes, which is all of, you know, Metro Vancouver. So it's, uh, it's really heartening to see that we're actually see some, uh, some positive signs here that we are making greener choices. The British Columbians are choosing uh, to use transit more, that they are choosing to reduce their sales of, uh, or their, their purchases of gasoline and, and other fossil fuels. You know, I made a choice this year. Well, I made a choice in 2005 when I was still mayor of Kamloops uh, to move into a townhouse downtown, uh, much to the chagrin of my daughter initially. But it turns out when you live downtown and the high school's downtown, guess where you hang out? You hang out at our place. And all the money I saved on gasoline, I had to go into Oreo cookies and chips and things like that because everyone hung out at our house. But we found that we, we just we could use only one car now. My wife takes uh, the transit to the university. Uh, we walk a lot more. And uh, we saw real differences in our household uh, pattern based on living in a townhouse in downtown Vancouver rather than a four-bedroom rancher in a suburb. We also made the choice this year to buy a Chevy Volt. Uh, and our clean energy vehicle program uh, I gave myself $5,000, not literally, guys, up there in the media, uh, through our clean energy vehicle program, which made the difference, really. I mean, you know, it, it helped me make that decision to buy a Chevy Volt. And it's so cool. You can look at your consumption. I plug in my car at home. Overnight, it's fully charged. I get from 50 to 70 kilometers on electricity. So if I'm just running around Kamloops, I never have to fill it with gas. And yet I can come down to Vancouver or wherever I'm going, and, and the gasoline kicks in. And overall, I think I've uh, lifetime uh, after about 8,000 kilometers in four months, I think I've got uh, 4.2 liters per 100 kilometers, which, in my very, very, very rough math, is you know over 100 miles a gallon. So, significant fuel reduction, and it makes sense because here in British Columbia, we're 93% clean renewable energy to create our electricity. So when I plug in, it doesn't mean that I'm you know burning coal to power my electricity. We also, uh, so we've got over 200 of those vehicles on the road. I'm somewhat disappointed, to be honest, that we haven't sold more. I thought we would sell more, and I think if the price of gasoline continued to rise, uh, more people would have thought about this. We do have the infrastructure program now, so we're putting in charging stations around the province. That, I think, is going to help, and I think so next year when these charging stations become active, because they have to be in by March of next year, we'll see more and more people buy into this program because there is still that range anxiety problem. And if they know that they can plug in while they're at work, uh, I think some of that will go away. So I'm, I'm hopeful that more of those vehicles will, uh, will sell. But we, um, we also uh, are encouraging the uh, conversion of, of diesel vehicles to uh, liquefied natural gas as Westport Technologies and Langley uh, and, and through the, their technology in Fortis, BC. There's all kinds of partnerships developing, especially for fleet vehicles, to switch over to natural gas, which is you know, much uh, uh, reduced in greenhouse gases versus uh, diesel. And far greater in particulate. And if you're talking about health issues, the particulate reduction is really important. 
In BC, we see a 48% growth in the clean tech uh, sector sales. I met with the Clean Energy BC yesterday. They are spending a billion dollars in the north of British Columbia. You know, we talk about LNG, and you know, we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, but the, the, the clean energy guys, and many are in partnership with First Nations, are already spending a billion dollars. I toured a wind farm up in Dawson Creek last year. Uh, we've approved more and more are on the way. Uh, they are amazing. Uh, the technology is getting better and better and better, becoming far more efficient. Uh, biomass is uh, really starting to grow. Uh, run of river projects, I think, uh, for those that haven't seen a run of river project or been through a, an environmental assessment of the, a run of river project, you would be, I think, surprised to learn how well they are done here in British Columbia and how little impact they have on the environment. Um, and again, of course, that's creating clean, green energy. Oh, sorry. We do have... Um, 20% uh, of lead gold buildings in Canada, right here in BC, so we punch above our weight in energy uh, reductions in buildings. And we have the most active district energy market in Canada as well. So we are uh, reviewing the carbon tax. Of course, when you're, when you're way out in front on a policy, uh, leadership is one thing, followership is another. And when you don't get the followership, it causes problems, mostly in competitiveness, because when you are competing with jurisdictions that don't have the same pricing regime you have in place, all of a sudden you put your businesses at a competitive disadvantage. So we are reviewing uh, the competitiveness issues around the carbon tax, and um, we should see those uh, if there are any changes in the carbon tax, because lots of people said we should continue increasing it and use those increases for specific initiatives. So all of that will be considered and will be rolled out uh, in the spring budget uh, where... Um, where that will be incorporated. So I don't know where that will go, uh, but we will find out in the spring. So challenges. Uh, we, we do have challenges, of course. Um, we want to grow our economy, and when you do increase uh, industrialization, commercialization, you're going to increase greenhouse gases. We have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for economic development with liquefied natural gas. That's going to pose a challenge for us meeting our targets. So we have to look to things like becoming the first jurisdiction in the world to use clean renewable energy uh, to liquefy natural gas. Now that you know, we want to do that as much as possible. We're in very active talks with the uh, natural gas industry at the moment as to how that can happen. And, um, you know, through use of offsets, uh, make sure that, again, that if we are increasing production on one side, that we have a way of reducing it on another. These are very fluid discussions at the moment. Uh, but we do want to continue our commitment to, um, to our climate action plan. Connecting the carbon policy to rural areas is always a bit of a challenge because people in Prince George or Kamloops or Clearwater say, well, I don't have the same options you do in downtown Vancouver or in Coquitlam or other places. So we look for ways that we can connect the climate action policies to rural BC. You mentioned the carbon, forest carbon offset protocol. That means we can create business in rural BC by growing trees. But also, uh, we've got this really neat uh, partnership with the Carbon Offset Aggregation Cooperative. And this is the Trucking Association out of Prince George. And basically what they do is they measure the fuel use and greenhouse gases through that fuel use as a baseline. Uh, they make changes, uh, driver training, uh, instrument changes, uh, tracking changes, and in some case, equipment changes. Then measure the savings in greenhouse gases, and then they can sell that to the Pacific Carbon Trust. So they can actually save fuel, again, makes sense from a business point of view, and then also get a dividend by, by selling the, the reduction of greenhouse gases as an offset. Uh, again, I talked about natural gas, so as much uh, we, as possible, we want to use clean, green, renewable energy for the liquef liquefaction of natural gas. We want to look at things like uh, carbon capture and storage, uh, and uh, we, uh, we are talking with industry very aggressively about how we can go about making some of these uh, moves as we increase the opportunities in British Columbia. So uh, we've got some other things, landfill management regulations that come into effect, uh, the um, things like uh, extended producer responsibility. So all the coffee cups that come out of Tim Hortons and Starbucks by 2014 will have to be recycled. The manufacturers and the purchasers of these uh, packages, all packaging and printed paper will have to be recycled. So again, that reduces the amount of uh, 
landfill volume and reduces greenhouse gases that way. So uh, we're, we're doing a lot, and British Columbians, I believe, uh, basically support what we're doing. We, we, of course, all governments hear the complaints about how it affects this person or this industry more than this person or this industry. But generally speaking, through polling we've done, uh, most British Columbians support leadership on climate change. Interestingly enough, and you're no stranger to this, uh, the tragedy of the commons says that even though people think it's a great thing to do, sometimes they don't want to pay the price themselves. And, and when uh, economics becomes a challenge for families, that is always a worry for governments about you know, how much uh, an individual family will, will increase their costs. We could increase the amount of green energy we produce in this province uh, enormously, but that does have a, an effect on the ratepayer, and we have to be very conscious of that as well. But uh, again, I'm very optimistic that we are headed in the right direction. I'm also optimistic that we're pulling other people with us. Uh, Alberta has a $15 a ton carbon tax on emissions over 100,000 per year. Uh, Australia put in a carbon tax this year. We are actually going to hear from a Republican from the United States who is working on a tax shift away from income over to carbon. Uh, so even in the United States with, uh, with conservatives, we're starting to see this dialogue happen because I think we've, places like British Columbia have shown that it can be done. And economically, uh, and from a policy point of view, it's, uh, it's a good thing to do. So I'll leave it there. I want to thank you very much for listening and welcome any questions you have. Thank you very much. Question that they like. Got one and two. Here we go. Thank you. My uh, name is Jens Wieting. I'm a forest campaigner with Sierra Club BC. Thank you, Minister, <clears throat> for this uh, great overview on some of the very positive initiatives your government is undertaking to fight climate change. Um, my question is about uh, uh, fossil fuels burning, um, fossil fuels extracted in British Columbia and other jurisdictions. And uh, about a year ago, the International Energy Agency warned that essentially <clears throat> any fossil fuel infrastructure built over the next five years will lock, uh, will lock us into catastrophic climate change. And looks like the fight against climate change is becoming entirely about the question who will step up to the plate and make decisions to uh, reduce uh, extraction of fossil fuels, slow down, and eventually um, phase out extracting fossil fuels. And um, in September, we released our report, Emissions Impossible, and found that uh, in addition to the 60 million tons of official emissions, there are over 100 million tons already resulting from burning coal and gas extracted in British Columbia. And that could increase to something like 200, over 200 million tons in, in the next few years if we go ahead with proposed coal mines and uh, LNG terminals. So the question is, uh, is the BC, BC government looking at a reporting function in addition to the official emissions report to measure up how cumulative emissions will increase resulting from fossil fuels extracted in British Columbia and burnt in other jurisdictions and look at that to develop a strategy to reduce our dependence on extracting fossil fuels for exports. Well, thank you for that. And it is, uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting debate uh, because in, in our liquefied natural gas strategy, one of the things we've said is you know, if we can take uh, British Columbia natural gas and, and use it to displace coal in Asia, we will see a global reduction in greenhouse gases. And people will say, well, you can't count that. You can only count your own. You can only count what you produce here. You can't take credit for reducing it there. And that's, we understand that. And, and generally, that's the way these things are accounted. They're accounted for what is burned in your jurisdiction. Now, most of the coal, almost all the coal that we ship is metallurgical coal. It's not thermal coal. Um, however, it still creates greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and unlike vegetarians who are willing to give up beef for their beliefs, I haven't met too many people against mining that want to give up copper or 
you know, all the things that we use every day that come from mining. So it is a very, unless we all make a commitment that we want to change our lifestyles dramatically, I think we will have that problem. And un until we can convince people or have the technology to address some of these issues, uh, we're, we're going to fight this. We're, we're going to have a hard time meeting our targets. I acknowledge we're going to have a hard time meeting our targets. And I think, you know, up to 2020, we're, we're probably going to be okay after 2020 unless we see some real ch game shifters in technology, which I'm optimistic that we will. You know, beyond 2020, we're going to have trouble. And, and you know, you saw the Bloomberg uh, piece this week. It's, glo it's a, a global warming, stupid, you know, all after it's Hurricane Sandy. I hope that people are starting to understand that, you know, we've, we've got to do something differently. But as government, it's very difficult to shift dramatically. It's, it's very difficult under the system of government we have in Canada. It's very difficult uh, to make giant steps. You have to set targets and, and make incremental steps towards it. You simply, as you mentioned, you've locked in this capital. We've got all this infrastructure based on fossil fuels. If we said tomorrow, we're just not going to do that anymore, we'd throw hundreds of thousands of people out of work. Hundreds of thousands of people would lose billions of dollars in their pension funds, in their RSPs. So while we know, you know intellectually what needs to be done, practically it's very difficult doing that without effecting dramatic change on people's lifestyles. We wouldn't be able to afford to pay two-thirds of the cost of university education, for instance. Okay, Minister Lake, I'm going to take two questions this time. I have one sure. that's coming from here, but I also have one that's coming over uh, twi Twitter. So we've got people following you, and uh, Carbon Talks is the is the hashtag, uh, hashtag Carbon Talks. So first, this question, and so if you can keep track of both of them, and then we'll, I'll get you to answer them. Okay. Mr. Minister, thank you very much for coming here today. My name's Dave, and I notice you've got a carbon tax review underway leading up to the 2013 budget. And in the past election, the last one, the NDP canvassed quite strongly, I believe, against carbon tax. If the NDP was to come to power, and it is a possibility next year, do you think they would make two or three or drastic changes to this long-term plan that your government has worked out? Thanks, Dave. And here's the second question. How does the huge growth in fracking and natural gas in northeast BC fit into BC's climate targets? So two questions. Okay, first of all, Dave, uh, I'm not sure what the NDP would do. They campaigned on axe the tax. You know, uh, they, um, it's, you know, the political system in Canada sucks that way. I mean, you know, we say black, they say white. I mean, it, it is the the game that we play in many ways. And we all say, oh, we should do it differently, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, it just, it's not practical. We have an adversarial kind of a system, that's the way it works. So I understand that they had to take a different position than us, although I, I would have, and sometimes, sometimes I think you have to support a policy if it's good. So they said axe attacks, they, they found the light after the election when they saw that environmentalists actually supported what we were doing. Um, and would they make changes? They say they would uh, use the, I believe, and I, the last thing I heard, they were going to use the, the carbon tax for green initiatives. But again, if they're going to do that, that means they are going to increase taxes because it's revenue neutral at the moment. And if you don't make it revenue neutral, that means a tax increase. And that's fine if they want to, if, they, if that's their platform, then please be transparent about it. Um, so you'd have to ask them, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but that's what I understand they would do if they would form the next government. And the next one was about the, the, the growth in uh, fracking. Uh, and, um, you know, we're seeing fracking technology has been used in British Columbia for 20 years. We do have a, a study underway in the northeast of BC to look at the industrial activity up there and, and whether or not it's having any effect on the health and the environment up there. Uh, we have a tremendous uh, regulatory system in British Columbia. They have to disclose all the fluids that they're using in fracking. Uh, there are some really interesting... Uh, leading technologies up there using grey water from Fort St. John and now Dawson Creek instead of using fresh water uh, for the fracking process, using deep saline aquifers instead of uh, freshwater aquifers. Uh, but there's no question that all over the world we're seeing fracking technology release tight oil and tight gas. So we will continue to see it, if not here in British Columbia, we'll see it elsewhere. 
As I mentioned earlier, we need to look at electrification as much as possible so that they don't have to use gas in the process as much to uh, provide the final product and look at uh, technologies like carbon capture and storage. But it is a challenge, no question. Okay, other questions? Here we go. Uh, stand up, I guess. Sure. Okay, uh, James, WWF, Canada. Um, quick question about the Earth Hour City Challenge. Uh, we've got five cities here signed up in the Lower Mainland, City of Vancouver being one. I was wondering what tools you think are available to cities to help them address this issue of climate mitigation. Uh, Earth Hour City Challenge basically focused on action to reduce mitigation yep. and inform about adaptation. But what did, what did you say to, to help them or incent them? Uh, yeah, what kind of tools has, oh, can the province right. provide to cities? Well, I, I think we, I, I've always participated in Earth Hour when I was mayor and as an MLA and, and, and we talk about it a lot, we promote it a lot and I think that's, you know, our role. I don't think we can mandate uh, cities to, to have or recognize Earth Hour. As I said, we've got some really great leaders out there in the local governments, uh, but there's some that, you know, that's not their top priority, and I don't think it's up to the BC government to do anything more than support the ones who join us in that leadership. But Earth Hour, you know, it's been criticized because, you know, it does, what really does it do? I think what it does is it reminds people what we're all working towards. And just like Hurricane Sandy reminds us of the effects and the impacts of climate change, Earth Hour makes us realize what we can do every day uh, to reduce our energy consumption. Rudy. Thanks. Uh, thank you for a very objective and informative talk. Um, I want, I'll, I'll try to make this into a question. It's kind of a statement. <laughs> a speech into a question. But, but, but like, like you. Like question period. Like, like you, yeah. Like you, I have a vault. And I'm not typical. So just going to work in Vancouver and back, I went over 6,000 miles on 32 liters. Wow. And I couldn't have done less because the thing switches you onto gas. If you're not, you had it on sport mode, didn't you? You were going too fast. No, no. It switches you over to gas when you haven't used enough gas to keep oh, right. the gas. Batteries, yeah. uh, so, so anyhow, it's a great thing. But, and like you, I, I'm amazed at the slow uptake, but not entirely because people are so hard to change. But just an observation that I'll make into a question. Uh, California recently allowed... Um, people driving electric cars, it might have been hybrids as well, I'm not sure, yeah, to go in the fast lane yep. with one passenger. And the, the sales in those types of vehicles just took off. I was wondering if that's something you're aware of and if that's a possibility for uh, BC. Well, thanks for the question. Uh, in fact, I've had that discussion with the new car dealers who uh, brought that to my attention because they're the ones running the clean energy vehicle program. So I discuss it with Transportation Minister Mary Polak. I haven't convinced her yet that it's the thing to do, but um, you know, I, I do think that it's it's a hard thing because HOV lanes are they're like religion, and if you all of a sudden change the rules on HOV lanes, you get huge pushback. Remember when you had to have four in a car at one time, which was ridiculous, and then you know we went to two, and that made sense. To me, allowing uh, electric vehicles makes sense, but I'm not sure it would make sense to everyone. So we would get our objective, which is to maybe increase the take up on electric vehicles. I think we'd make more people upset with us, uh, and politics is the art of the possible. So while I, I will continue to have those discussions and follow what's happened in California, because if we can demonstrate that it didn't plug up the lanes or, or that it increased, you know, if we achieved our objectives and it didn't it give you the good things without the bad things. If I can make that case, then I'll try to make that case. But it's, a, again, a policy that does impact behavior. So I, I think it's something to explore for sure. Maybe you could do it every other day. And see how that works. Okay, we have a question what? here. <laughs> Thanks for making my life so simple. <laughs> Uh, hi, Minister Lake. My name is Valerie Langer. I'm with Forest Ethics Solutions. And um, for about a decade now, since the Stern Report and then the International Panel on Climate Change, have consistently stated that uh, protecting forests is one of the cheapest ways to maintain carbon on the ground rather than releasing it into the atmosphere. 
And I'm wondering, since this is a clear um, avenue for the province to enact uh, dual goals of um, protecting bio biological diversity and um, reducing emissions, I'm wondering how specifically the review um, of uh, the midterm timber supply in the interior of British Columbia is going to play into um, a climate strategy in British Columbia and likewise in a broader sense um, where new learnings from places like the Great Bear Rainforest could be applied to reduce the total amount of forest logged and um, create policies to mm -hmm. increase the number of jobs per cubic meter um, as a different economic strategy that's conservation oriented. No, uh, thanks, Valerie, for the question. I mean, if anyone wants to see the impact of climate change, you look at the mountain pine beetle situation, and you know I, I, our area has been not the hardest hit by any means, but certainly uh, we were severely impacted by the mountain pine beetle. Just on a personal level, it cost me five thousand dollars to remove trees from my yard. You know, and you talk about cost to families. That was huge for a lot of people in the interior. It was just removing those dead trees from the yards, which became a, a hazard. But look at the impact on the forest industry, look at the impact on the tourism industry, the golf industry, all of that because of climate change, because we didn't have the cold winters that we used to have. So we've got this dying forest and it's ripe for replanting. So our forest carbon offset protocol enables or is one tool that facilitates that. And you know, we've got this sort of dual problem. We want to grow the forest in the Great Bear Rainforest and using, you know, different silviculture techniques, including fertilization and all of that does increase the amount of carbon uptake. So there are things that we can do that will help us re replant the forest. And, uh, and we've incentivized it with the forest carbon offset protocol. And if we can bring in offsets as part of our uh, strategy around our liquefied natural gas production, that will, again, stimulate that as well. But we've also got the very real problem of sawmills in the interior without enough wood to keep people working. Again, it's the art of the possible. So my goal as environment minister is try to influence that policy as much as possible towards conservation. And don't forget, in British Columbia, we have over 14% of our land base in parks or protected areas, which is way above uh, just about anywhere else in Canada, certainly above the UN uh, recommendation. So all of those areas are serving that conservation uh, role uh, now. But I take your point. As we go forward economically, we have to think about the real opportunities economically as well as from a conservation value uh, point on replanting the forest. Hey, thanks. Uh-oh. <laughs> it's okay. It's benign. Hi, Minister. Thanks for, uh, for coming. Um, you, you noted the revenue neutral, neutral carbon tax uh, did cut corporate and personal income tax rates. British Columbia now has the lowest corporate tax rate in the country. Is your government tracking the impact of uh, reducing the corporate tax rate on uh, new companies, businesses wanting to invest in BC. You know, I'm a glass half full kind of girl, and instead of talking about loss of you know competitiveness issues, that's a real competitiveness issue. So, two part question: Are we tracking that? Do we know if it's had any impact? And who are the industries moving in, and what kind of jobs are they creating? So, the whole the whole uh, energy package and and environmental package should be stimulating jobs that both are are clean and green. So. You know, can, can you share any good news, or, are we, or is it too early to tell? Well, I, thanks for the question, Nancy. It, it is, um, it's hard to tell. I mean, we, we've seen our GDP rise, so we know that people are continuing to invest in British Columbia. And, and look at the huge investment we see on the horizon. As I mentioned, clean energy, a billion dollars in the north right now. Uh, we've got $60 billion worth of, of projects on the books. But a lot of them are resource extraction, which, you know, are high GHG producers. So they, uh, they're paying a lot of carbon tax, but they recognize that the opportunities here in BC, partly through their corporate, low corporate taxes, is an incentive to come here. And Gordon Campbell always used to sit down with these guys. They'd come in and complain about the carbon tax. And he'd say, look, don't talk just about the carbon tax. Tell me about your corporate income tax. Tell me about you know, your personal income tax. Tell me about how uh, people want to work in British Columbia and live in British Columbia. Like You have to take it as a whole package. I don't think we're really scaring off industries in BC with our with our policies in fact I think we're encouraging industries to come to British Columbia and we've seen a greater increase in clean technology here in BC than elsewhere in Canada so we are having an impact I don't think we talk enough about the clean energy sector here um, and we've got 
we've got a, a, a problem in that there are some people in the environmental movement who simply don't like some of the clean energy producers, Run of River particularly. Um, and so you can, it's hard to support them when there's part of the environmental movement that's against them. Uh, so I've been to uh, independent power projects. I've seen how they work. I've been through the great big binders to approve them. I've seen how they go back and forth and talk about in-stream flow requirements for different phases of, of salmon life. Uh, I see a, a tremendous amount of work that goes into ensuring that they are protecting the environment while producing clean energy, but there are some people philosophically opposed. So uh, that's a long way of saying, yes, I think, I think people are attracted to British Columbia. However, when you've got Alberta next to you, because they have low corporate taxes, they have low personal taxes as well. I wish we were next to Ontario. <laughs> then we'd have, we wouldn't have a competitive problem at all. Two questions, one from Twitter, one from me. So the first question is, we've heard um, our, our Premier talk about using the liquid natural gas for uh, providing um, energy support to Japan and to China. In the context of China, we can make the case on transitional fuels. In um, Japan, we have a much more difficult time doing that. So where does liquid natural gas, in terms of an export to Japan, put us in terms of reaching our GHG targets? That's the first question. The second is from Twitter, and it's from a BC perspective. What is your take on the federal energy policy? Oh. <laughs> that wasn't my question, honestly. That was Did really that come from, from the media in the back? I'm not sure. It came from Twitter. Get him to say something controversial. Uh, well, first of all, let's talk about Japan. Now, of course, Japan, uh, nuclear power was the backbone of energy in Japan, and you know, this isn't a position of the BC government, but my personal opinion is nuclear energy is a big part of the solution to, uh, to, to our greenhouse gas problem. However, if the Japanese decide they're not going to use nuclear power and they're going to use natural gas to produce electricity, well then use our natural gas. It's not us telling them to use natural gas. They have made the decision not to use nuclear power. So if they're going to use natural gas, why not our natural gas? It's produced in a wonderful province. We have great labor laws. We have great uh, environmental laws. I would rather they use our natural gas than someone else's natural gas if they've already made that decision. It does pose a challenge for our greenhouse gas emissions here in BC, which is why we need to talk about electrification. We need to talk about uh, carbon capture and storage. Uh, but it's not us forcing them to use natural gas. They've made that decision, so why don't we provide it because we, we do it very well. We do it very safely. Uh, in terms of the federal energy policy, you know, Peter Kent, uh, the environment minister federally, and I are actually, we have a very good working relationship. We have very different views on the way forward. Um, Ottawa has decided on a regulatory approach to greenhouse gases, which, let's face it, is a pricing system. I don't care if you're talking cap and trade, carbon tax, or regulation. They're all cost money and it all filters down to the consumer eventually. So different tools to get what we think is to the same place. And you know we choose one, they choose another. Um, we had the Canadian Council of Ministers of the Environment, and we were just wrapping up our communique and went through, I think, 15 versions of the communique. And um, the Alberta Environment Minister was chair. And she said, well, is there anything anyone would like to add? And so I put up my hand, and she looked at me and kind of shook her head and said, yes, Terry. I said, I thought we could just add at the end that we've all agreed to a national revenue neutral carbon tax. <laughs> and you know, Peter Kent just laughed, right? I mean, he's, he understands and we have different approaches. I believe, I really do believe the federal government wants to get to the same place, but they choose different ways of getting there. Um, uh, but the, he's very good to work with and, uh, and what they do uh, recognize is what we're doing. So they don't, you know, we've got a, a kind of an agreement not to double regulate. They'll accept what we're doing as equivalent to what they're trying to accomplish. We're using different instruments, that's all. Okay, other questions? Go. Uh, yeah, you just stated that uh, you wanted to develop liquid natural gas in BC, which is one of the stated goals in the strategy. Mm -hmm. um, but you want to do that with electrification. Uh, how do you propose to achieve that goal when essentially you've also said in BC Hydro reports that <clears throat> BC is running out of uh, rivers to tap for hydroelectricity. So how do you propose uh, powering this liquid natural gas 
uh, expansion? That's a very good question. I, I don't believe that I've ever seen BC Hydro say we're, we've run out of rivers to tap for, for electricity. However, even with Site C, uh, if all of the proposed liquefied natural gas plants went forward, we, we still would be about 20% short of what we need. So we, uh, we're going to have to increase our production of electricity. And can we provide all of the needs through uh, clean, green electricity? I don't know. And, and we're going to uh, do as, uh, the first two we think we can. After that, it's going to be a challenge. And that's why if they're going to use natural gas produced electricity, we have to find a way uh, to, uh, to mitigate that in other ways, in other parts of the greenhouse gas inventory or in the, in the natural gas inventory as well through, again, carbon capture and storage, technologies that probably are post-2018, 2019 when these things start to come on stream. Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan. I'm a student here. Uh, it's been mentioned a few times that the, the clearest way to mitigate environmental damage is to uh, ultimately make a shift in, in our lifestyles and behavior, using less and buying less. When, when our whole economy is built on consumerism and buying more and using more, how do you see that circling with, uh, with, those, with the, the other objective of, of reducing environmental damage? That's a very good question. I talk about this with my kids all the time. You know, we've got so much stuff. And we, we have to think about why we're buying this stuff. Uh, Metro Vancouver, through their solid waste management plan, had a really good campaign last couple of Christmases. I don't know if you saw it in the SkyTrain stations. Buy an experience, you know, instead of stuff. And they actually saw a reduction in the amount of stuff going to the landfill after those, those uh, initiatives. And they've made that initiative available, that all they add, you know, the art and everything, available across Canada. And... We are doing that through our extended producer responsibility program. So when you buy those headphones that you've got, for instance, or your, you know, your iPad or whatever, you pay a, a, a fee. It's either visible or built in, but you pay a fee for the recycling of that product. So in other words, the, con the producer and the consumer pay for the whole life cycle of the product. And it does, again, change behavior. It makes you think twice about whether you really need it. I was looking at my flat screen TV and realized I still had some of the 2008 Olympics on there. And I thought, wow, I've had that TV for four years. Must be time to get another one. I thought, well, what a ridiculous statement. I don't need another TV. But we have to ask ourselves those questions all the time. But, uh, but the extended producer responsibility programs make you think about it. Also makes the, the producers of the product think about the best way to recycle it so that they're not adding to the cost of the product uh, so, you know, to reduce sales. So I think we're getting there slowly, but it's, it's all of us. We have to think about the crap we buy. Last question. Here we go, and it's coming on that side. I know I'm going to get in trouble for this. Hi, Terry. Don't worry. It's an easy one. Uh, just, uh, my name's Michael. I'm a clean energy developer in BC. Uh, just further to the question, just before that, on the amount of electricity, um, British Columbia has an amazing wind resource. Mm -hmm. um, there's probably about 10 times the required wind resource to meet the load that uh, is required for LNG. Um, but the problem is economics and coming back to what people are willing to pay. And uh, the, best, the best way I've ever heard it put was a few years ago uh, when someone said to me, and I probably challenge everyone in the room that I would expect everyone in this room pays more for their smartphone per month than for their electricity. That's wrong. There's something wrong there. And that doesn't mean smartphones are too expensive. Electricity is too cheap. And if you look at gasoline prices over the last 50 years, if you look at hydro prices, electricity is too cheap across the globe, but in BC, it's way too cheap. And the big challenge for LNG is how do you add 100% clean renewable energy for the price that they expect that electricity in BC. And that's the challenge. And I don't know how you solve, well, I do know how to solve that, but everyone in this room is going to pay more for electricity than their smartphone. It's, it's a really, really good point that you make. First of all, uh, on the wind side, we do have a, a tremendous wind resources. Um, but it is a challenge in terms of the, uh, the firmness, the battery power of wind. And so we need a combination of things to, to help us in that mix. But your point about spending more on a smartphone than electricity is very well taken. The difficulty is uh, when you 
when you buy your smartphone, it's a choice you have. Electricity is deemed uh, to be a necessity of life. And it's the government who's charging you for it, not a private company that you elect. So Nancy probably can give you the economics uh, philosophy of all of that, uh, but it's a very good point. As someone in government, though, it doesn't help me because if I say, well, don't, why, why are you worried about the price of electricity? It's, it's less than your smartphone. You know, the, I would get pilloried in the press for saying that uh, because people expect that to be part, just like, you know, heating their home, uh, uh, affordable food, affordable housing. Those are things people expect in our society. The smartphone they see as an add-on, even though, let's face it, it's almost a necessity now. But it's a very, very good point. Wow. It's wonderful to actually see one of our ministers come and be open to have the kind of questions. You could have got any question from this audience, and you filled it beautifully. It was Thank lovely. You. you can see the educator in you. I think I'd like to take a class. Um, I want to say a big thank you. I have a couple of announcements. I want to make sure Tom is at November 26th is our next session. November 20th. November 20th on liquid natural gas. We've got people that are both proponents and those that might have some criticisms about that. Uh, Dave Austin and Mark Lee in the room right next door. Uh, so that's November 20th for Carbon Talks. I want to say a big thank you to all of you. I want to say a special shout out to our public policy class, our Masters in Public Policy. Let's see a hands of the, the public policy group here. Cool. Wow. These are our, our, our policy makers in, in, in the making. Um, a big thank you to our uh, supporters. We have North, North Growth Foundation and PICS and the SFU Center for Dialogue. Thank you most of all to you Thanks and to so. your staff for making yourselves available and to all of you. Take care. Thank you.